And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast, on a Monday. Hope you had a, a great weekend. We are back after, uh, well, our biggest week ever last week. We appreciate everybody uh, downloading the podcast, listening. Hopefully you left a, a five-star rating and a comment. All of that matters in today's world. We'll keep it rolling this week as uh, the Florida swing is here. I'm looking out my window right now, Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. The sun is out. We've been having incredible weather. The tour comes over here now, so we're looking forward to the Florida swing. So much to talk about in the world of professional golf. Uh, we're going to talk some instruction today as well. And I've been working on this guest for quite some time. And uh, he joins me here today. Peter Costas, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Travis, thanks for having me. Look well, I'm a, I'm, I've always been a fan of yours because uh, I'm an instructor by trade, but I do like the media aspect of it. You're an instructor by trade. I watched you on CBS for years and years. And I just love to see the instructor also be able to do all the other things as well and talk golf, have an opinion, all of those things. And uh, you were a pioneer in that. So this is a big honor for me to have you on. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. So there's a lot to talk about here in professional golf. There's, there is nothing short of uh, storylines. My goodness, uh, we've never you know, seen anything like this. And we're going to get to instruction in a second. But I, you know, I got to ask you, I mean, this is crazy times right now we have this rival league or two rival leagues really one seems to have more money than the other the one backed by saudi arabia and now all the big names have come out uh dj joins the crowd hovland morikawa bryson sends out a note saying look their alliances with the pga tour that adds to a list of jt speed etc etc it feels like on a monday morning peter um the saudi league might have just got their last nail in the coffin, you think? It's looking like that right now, for sure. Um, you know, uh, Phil's comments uh, didn't do anybody any good whatsoever, mm -mm. especially him. And, and as a consequence, uh, I think that freed up, uh, Mickelson's comments freed up other guys to be able to come out and and um, and say, look, I, I never really wanted to be involved with it in the first place, even though they probably did or, or they were exploring it. Um, I think in, in some respects, you'd be stupid not to explore it because you don't know what it is until you find out. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I think the media did a, a, a fairly good job of, of making it difficult for players to, to play because they used the, uh, the Saudi Arabia angle and the, and the human rights abuses and, and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, the, the PGA Tour lives to fight another day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems it seems like they've got they've lost some some steam for sure. You know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, just it was just four or five days ago that rumor has it that they were going to be announcing the twenty names, Players Championship Week. But let's face it, all this big money they needed they needed one or two of these guys to make the leap. I know Phil's still a name; he's the PGA champ, but you've got to have some of these other players. So yeah, Phil's kind of left out there now, you know, a little bit after his comments, very surprising. And let me ask you this, um, and then we'll get to some instruction. You know, Rory had some pretty strong comments about Phil. You don't see this a lot in golf where guys come out and lay it out there. Phil's certainly done it. He did it with Tom Watson. Um, he's done it with the USGA. He's done it with the PGA tour, but I'll just read a quick quote here. I just want to get your thoughts quickly. You know, Rory at the end of the round says, look, I don't want to kick someone while they're down. Uh, but, uh, you know, his comments were naive, selfish, ignorant, and egotistical. That was Rory about Phil Mickelson. Did that surprise you? Well, if he says that and he doesn't want to kick anybody when they're down, I, I hate to see what happens if he does want to kick somebody when they're but, down. But, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, again, I, I, I'm kind of out of the, the media business now and mm -hmm. I get to look back and, and, and see things from a different perspective. And it seems to me like everybody whose income is attached in some fashion or form to the PGA tour, you know, whether it's, whether it's podcasts or teachers or uh, whatever, it doesn't make any difference. If, if your income is tied to the PGA tour, you were anti Saudi golf league because you didn't know if maybe um, your income was going to be af affected. Right. And, and people who are not 
tied to the PGA Tour had a little bit more open mindedness about about this whole thing. I mean, when you look at the NFL, Travis, I mean, back in the day, they had the USFL, right? And they challenged and then so then they merge and you end up with the AFC and the NFC and, and where NFL football is is today. I'm not saying that could have happened with the Saudi Golf League, but competition's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, yeah, no, yeah, competition generally is a good thing. And I mean, you made a tweet about referencing, you know, it doesn't matter where the money's coming from from a competition standpoint. I think in this regard, probably does with given Saudi Arabia's um, human rights issues and some of the things that the way that they go there. Um, but I think with that said, and, and this league may not ever get to um, the first T per se, but just the idea of it, I do think has been a real threat and the competition has forced the tour to make some decisions and some decisions that I think are good, you know, in elevating some of their higher profile players and moving some money that way. And there'll probably be some others, but yeah, I do think competition generally is a good thing. This was a difficult one to really wrap your mind around given that it was um, Saudi Arabia and it'll be interesting to see where things go here with the players just a couple weeks away. Um, but not taking up the entire podcast on a rival league. Um, it's, it's just fascinating times, you know, to see where we're at right now. And, and as well, I mean, I, I've, I've said it many times on social media. I hate selective outrage. I, mm. I really do. I mean, I, I, this, this cancel culture world that we live in now, I'm, I'm pretty much glad I'm out of TV because you can't mm. say anything anymore without somebody jumping down your throat. Right. I, I Jack Nicholas got no repercussions whatsoever when he announced that he was building golf courses in Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, China, all the stuff that's going on there. If we're going to be outraged about anything and everything, then we, no one's going to get any better at anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to just kind of take a deep breath and, and let things kind of settle down. I, I, you know, no one picked on Jack when, when he agreed to a multi-million dollar contract with Saudi to build golf courses. And I don't think they should have. I mean, mm -hmm. it's free enterprise, right? Um, and the same with the, with the tours. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you like the PIP money player incentive program? Do you like some of this discussion of what they're, they're considering now in the fall? You know, this is all Look, new stuff. I, I think the tour needs to be more transparent about mm -hmm. everything. Uh, I think that's, that's the, that's the whitewash that needs to happen. The bleach that needs to be put on the PGA tour. I mean, they don't even announce the winners of the PIP. They don't announce the voting. They don't announce the, the method of, of, of deciding who gets what um, they don't even announce the voting for player of the year or whatever. They don't announce fines. They don't announce suspensions. They don't announce anything. Um, the, the tour basically is very, very secretive and, and that needs to change mm -hmm. in that regard. I think Phil is right. Right. I, I yeah. think, look, I, I did the, the Konica Minolta stuff for, I don't know how many years, mm -hmm. uh, over 16 years and the PGA tour, uh, puts those out on social media. They just had one this weekend of me analyzing Joaquin Neiman's swing when he first came on tour whatever. And they make money off of that. Right. I get none of it. Mm -hmm. That's my content. That's my expertise. That's my years of, of toiling on the, on the teaching tee and, and having the ability to, to say it succinctly and simply to millions of viewers, the tour is making money off of that. I, I get nothing. Do you think the media rights is a real um, factor on the table because in any sporting event or any sport, professional sports, these, these players don't have access to media, right? I mean, that is the number one thing that they can obviously leverage from a sales standpoint in getting TV contracts. I mean, if, if you've got everybody trying to leverage off of media rights and what they did right there, whether it's a player or an analyst, that seems like a slippery slope, doesn't it? I mean, cause now who's going to come in and pay all that money for, for the TV. If, if every player teacher can set up cameras and boom cameras and all this Monday through Wednesday before they play. No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. I, I okay. don't, I, what I'm saying is that once 
the the CBS broadcast is over on a Sunday night. Mm. The PGA Tour owns those rights. CBS doesn't own them. Uh, the announcers don't own them. The players don't own them. The PGA Tour does. Now, what the PGA Tour does with that content is profitable. They make money off of it. And and as such, uh, you know, should they share the profits? I don't know. That that's that's open for debate. Th- this was this was of no value um, until the internet came along in social media. Right. Right. So they, they use old rules. Um, you know, I always used to say that people used to come up with me and say, we, I love you on the golf channel. And I go, well, I, I don't work for the golf channel. I said, well, I saw you there last night. So the, the golf channel paid for the rebroadcast rights of all the CBS events. Nobody at CBS got any income mm. from, from those rebroadcasts. Speaking of the Conic of Minolta biz hub, right? And all these breakdowns that I've watched over the years um, with you. People don't realize how difficult that is. I mean, I I worked for the Golf Channel for, I don't know, five years in, in live TV and doing breakdowns. And, you know, you know how it is. You got 45 seconds ready to go, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you got a lot to say. And, but you got to do it this kind of time, send it back. It's way more difficult for you when you were doing it because you had you're out there walking, right in the heat of the action. And I I, w- I would assume Peter like it was hey Peter we're coming to you in thirty seconds and we want you to talk about so and so. Ready? Are you ready for that? Go. I mean this is it's not easy to do. Well, it's not even thirty seconds sometimes. So I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story about how I came to um, to wear that that contraption around okay. my neck. Is that uh, we were in Charlotte um, at Quail Hollow and uh, very first hole and. Speaking of Mickelson, it was Mickelson. I was following Mickelson's group, and mm-hmm. our producer um, says uh, Phil had hit his second shot into into the old first green, and I had a young college kid who was carrying my monitor for me, and and Lance Barrow, our producer, said, "All right, let's go, Mickelson, swing, swing vision, go," and and I look around and my college guy with the monitor was a hundred yards down the fairway talking to this statuesque blonde behind the ropes, trying to get a date. Mm. And I had no monitor. Mm. And so, so I, I, on talk back, I said, Lance, let me know when the swing starts. And he goes, go. And so then I, I did it knowing Phil's golf swing. I, <laughs> I, I BS my way through it. Nobody ever knew that I didn't have a monitor at the time. <laughs> So I realized that if I'm going to keep doing this, uh, I need to control my own destiny. I can't have a, a college kid holding my uh, my monitor. Yeah. Why not? Why not more instruction in TV and in these telecasts? I, I I feel like it's so underserved. Not just instruction, but just like real insight from someone like yourself or me or someone who look has the TV media background understands. The, the golf swing short game has relationships with coaches and, and players and can bring that perspective and art, articulate on the craft that these players have. And it's so dynamic now. I just still feel like Peter, that it's just, I don't know. It's underserved. I just, I've always thought a teacher with the media background should be at the table more talking all things golf. Am I wrong? Yeah. No, I mean, years ago uh, they did a study CBS did and, and, why people tune in to watch PGA Tour golf. And first and foremost, they, they tuned in to watch the players, the, the competition. Uh, number two, um, they, they tuned in to maybe learn something that would help them when they went to the golf course the next time. And number three was uh, wanting to see a particular player, the, the fan favorite player that, that was in competition. So CBS figured out that um, people wanted to learn something, right? And, and I think that's still valuable. Although now, in my experience watching, I don't really watch as much anymore as I used mm-hmm. to. Um, it, it's all a, a bunch of ex tour players speaking tour speak to each mm-hmm. other, trying to sound smart, and no one's talking to the viewer. That really disappoints me. No one's yeah. talking to the twelve handicap, the twenty handicap, the five handicap, whatever. They're all they're all using tour speak language, and and you know what that is, mm-hmm. right? Sure. I mean, he, he he got under it, flipped it, and that's why he hooked it. And that doesn't mean anything to yeah. to Joe and Sally out there, right? 
you got to you got to speak to the to the viewer in a mean in a, in a way that they understand. Yeah. Yeah, and there's entertainment too. And you can do it in an entertaining way, right? Like Konica Minolta and different ways to um, you know, put the informa <clears throat> information out there and tell the story mm -hmm. about the journey that these guys take. Because to me, and I'm in this and I'm biased, but the journey they take is 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 interesting. I mean, the way these guys go about their craft and it's so dynamic now. There's so much specialization in the sport. Um, there's so much technology in the sport. So let's kind of transition to that now. Um, as you, you mentioned, you kind of, you're on the outside looking in from a media side, but you still teach a decent amount. You teach Paul Casey and you have for 21 years. We'll get to that. But where do you think this is all going? And where do you think instruction is going? Is more and more technology um, is it good? Is it bad? Is it relevant? I was, I was on the T in Palm Springs. I'm walking the line. Every one of these players has the, the launch monitor set up. And Peter, I was shocked. Like I know they use it and I'm close to it. I'm not naive to it, but I'm talking every shot they hit, they look down and see what the number was. It hit, looked, I mean, I'm talking 90% of them, every shot they hit is where's this going? Is it good, bad, or neither? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's, it, it's, we don't know. We have to wait and see. I, yeah. I, I do know this. I'll tell you the good of using the launch monitor. The players that I know that use it, it used to take you a while to take your golf swing to the golf course and, and, and become playable. Learn your yardages was, was a, a huge factor because you didn't yeah. know, you know, you'd go from Phoenix to, to Monterey. And, you know, you got the ball flying farther in Phoenix and going shorter in Monterey. And it took you a couple of days to figure out what your yardages are. So if, if those players are all looking down and just just seeing how far that nine iron went or just seeing how far that that five iron went and they and they recalibrate their numbers in their head for this week, then I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it, it can it can make them lazy. They don't play as many practice rounds and and learn the golf course maybe as as much as they could otherwise. But uh, at least they have their their yardages down. So when they go to the golf course, they'll know they'll know what what club to hit. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm more um, bothered by the fact that I see teachers back there and they're looking down at the, at the iPad and checking the numbers that they're not looking at the golf ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one's watching the golf ball anymore. Well, I shouldn't say no one, but, but yeah. the vast majority of, of people are out there are, are using numbers um, to justify what they're doing. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good thing. I've yeah. always said, I don't, I don't teach the golf swing. I, I don't, I teach mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And I have to know the person that I'm working with so that I can teach them on their terms. I'm not yeah. going to make them learn my language or, or, you know, my philosophies or this or that. I'm going to give them a language and a philosophy that they understand and it will help them get better. Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, I, I think most of them are using it for, for distance. And I agree. I think it's, it's a good thing. I was just shocked. Like how, you know, I mean, it's, it's every ball, 90% of the balls. Yep. And it's right in front of them anymore, right? Like yep. the, there's, there's one you can sit right in front. There's another one back here. Some of them get both of them going at the same yep. time. <laughs> well, but, and, and also in their defense, Travis, um, when you look at where they're, they're cutting the pins these days. Yeah. I mean, you really have yeah. uh, a, a, a minuscule margin of error in distance control mm -hmm. on the PGA tour. If you're going to attack any pins. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have to, you have to know those numbers, right? So I think, yeah, that, you do. I think that's yeah. a good thing. Yep, it is. I think it's a fair point that could they be a bit more lazy? It does feel like just in general, perhaps less playing rounds. Of course, the veterans have seen the course, so they don't maybe need to see it quite as much. Um, but there is, um, there's certainly, there's certainly things that, you know, there's so much technology there, right? Like 2D now is in 3D video. There's force plates. There's all kinds of things that you can get your hands on. Look under the hood. And just make it and be that much more efficient. But all the time, but in saying that, and I want to transition to this now. Every player out there wants to get better. There, and every amateur listening to this podcast that plays golf, they they want to get better. The intentions are good. I've never met anybody who said, "Yeah, I'm just too damn good. I'm just kind of hitting it too far right now. I need to you know tailor things back." I mean, we're all trying to move the needle forward. And then you watch some of the decisions that are made on tour about changes that they're going to make to their swing. Now, 
there's a lot of changes that are small. I'm not talking about, hey, let's move the ball position a little here. Let's let's get a little more behind it. Let's, you know, like there's incremental things, maintenance things. That's that's pretty straightforward. There's a lot that goes on where you got players jumping around and then they start taking on significant changes, whether it's chasing distance like Spieth did. We'll get to that in a second. But most recently, Peter, the one that baffles me the most is what Ricky Fowler's tried to do and the changes that he's went through in the last three years. And I know what the changes are, and I can speak to him as far as, you know, the the pivot and the way that he wants to change his body, the way he wants to change the club, which just in themselves, the independently, the, the body change is a big change. Independently, the club change is a big change. He's trying to do both at the same time. Not anymore. He's kind of, you know, the club aside, he's put that one, he's tabled that one. But these are significant changes. He goes down this path, and it's... It didn't work, Peter. Like, you've seen this a ton through your time, right? Significant changes, and all of a sudden, the player loses the DNA, the genius that got him to that point. Why is that? Well, I mean, I've always said, and let me go back one 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 step with the technology and the stuff that we were talking about before. Okay. I, I collect quotes. I, I, I'm a fan of quotes, and mm-hmm. one of my favorites is, information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom can only come through experience, mm. Albert Einstein. Mm. Um, and, and so the, the people who have all this knowledge, whether it's launch monitors or force plates or this or that, it, it, it's, it, that all that information doesn't make them knowledgeable, right? Right, And it doesn't make them wise. And so then if you're not wise, you, you're going to make mistakes about how you help this particular player. Mm. Because it's not about whether you're, four degrees from the inside or, or your whatever it's, it's about the player's personality. And I I've maintained Travis that especially with a lot of these guys, once they're, let's pick an age, let's say 15, they all played a lot as juniors and this and that. Once they're age 15, their golf DNA is set, whatever it is, that's their DNA. Just like your DNA is what it is. Mine is what it is. We can't change it. Now we can eat healthy and exercise and, maximize our dna but i'm never going to be six foot four right (laughs) and and so take ricky for example uh ricky i think there's two ways to to swing a golf club generally speaking Mm -hmm. either you swing your body or you body your swing now Mm -hmm. in in simple terms that means you know you learn to swing the hands and arms and, and your body moves in response to that swinging motion or you learn to move your body and your arms and hands respond to that motion. Both very playable, both yeah. very doable. But you can't have one person do both. This happened to Tiger, in my opinion. Mm. Tiger was always a, a swinger of the hands and arms as a junior. And his first few years on tour when he worked with butch he 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 swung his body now his body moved uh very aggressively right but yeah. it moved in anticipation of his swing he didn't use those body movements to create his swing mm-hmm. and then as his as his swing evolved and he, he decided he wanted to make changes he went for a while there and he was bodying his swing he had lost his dna even as talented as he was and is he he crossed over, in my words, to the dark side because he was he was bodying his swing, that created more issues on his back, that created more issues on on his ability to control the golf ball. And then once he came back from his back fusion, he could no longer body his swing, and he started going back to his roots uh, of of swinging his body. Yeah. And lo and behold, he wins the 2019 Masters. Right. Yep. So with Ricky, um, he's he's not a he's not a technical person. He's not a position player. He's a feel player. Mm-hmm. He's a rhythm and, and motion player. And and so you got to be careful with how you disseminate information to him. In my opinion, because you don't want him to get away from his roots. Yeah, I think that for a while um, he was he was so focused on on the backswing and positions and and whatnot that he lost sight of how to play golf ricky fowler style yeah i think it's all fair point and 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 with that said there's such a a laundry list of names that 
go down that path. And I think Ricky's changes are significant changes. Um, but the DNA, I use that word all the time, and I think it's valid. There's a DNA, a genius in that player. They wouldn't be on the PGA Tour if they didn't have that. And I think, you know, the first step is always protecting that. Okay, sure, you're trying to get better, but we got to protect what you do Mm -hmm. and make incremental changes around that. And I think what's really fascinating is then when you take the attitude, okay, we're going to go after our weakness. When you go after the weakness, it doesn't mean the strength's going to maintain, right? Like you're, you're assuming that, okay, this will be a strength and I can go after my weakness, which I'm going to neglect some time towards my strength. And then they try to attack the weakness and then their strength gets worse. <laughs> so the net is like, you know, so it's just a very difficult thing to do. And I'm not saying that players can't seek improvement, but my goodness, it's a very, very delicate thing. I think it happened to Spieth. He went after distance, best putter in the world. As he tries to go down that, he loses, you know, it's taking him time to get his pieces back together in his swing, loses his putting. Now you're in but, a tough spot. Yeah, and, and and you can say the same thing about Ricky. I, I think Ricky... Very uh, true, yep. ...had, had in, in my eyes, just a brilliant putting stroke. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was awesome. Yep. The way it arced up and down... It, into into in and and the flow of the putter head i thought was brilliant and and in spending a lot of time um working on your full swing you, you neglect the stuff that you think is always going to be there and yeah. then you wake up one day and it's not and now you <laughs> screw. Right? well to your point 2016 and 17 um when he was playing well you know kind of sandwiched in there he won the honda which is this week he won waste management back in 2019. You know, he had a number of second place finishes and major championships. He was first in strokes gained putting in 2016 and 17. I think going into this week, he was 205th. Yeah. And you've seen it before. I mean, you can go back. I mean, I've seen major champions winners, Curtis Strange, Seve Ballesteros, Ian Baker Finch. Uh, you know, you can go on and on with, with, with people who have ended up winning, you know, one of, golf's four holy grails yeah and and they're in an attempt to get better they lost their game they, wow they lost sight of who they were and 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 they they didn't ever play to that level again yeah they did it they, they did the, ro- the wrong thing for the right reasons <laughs> you know that's why that's why i think what bryson's done is so fascinating to me i mean because stati- statistically if you look at spieth and fowler and those are two big names and you look at him statistically, even Fowler, like strokes ain't off the tee and approach. He he has started to put some of the pieces back together. Like, okay, strokes ain't approach, he's 73rd. Strokes ain't off the tee, he's 43rd. That's like, all right, so he's getting into that upper third, but he still wasn't where he was back in 15, 16. He was 18th and 38th. So it's like he's getting closer, but through that, he sacrificed his putting. Same thing with speed. Um you know, yeah, he was awful for two years. We're talking at the bottom of the PGA Tour off the tee. He's 44th now, um, but he's 126 putting. So it's like the net is, they're just not that same version of themselves before they went down that path. It's just tough to see. It, 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 I don't know. It's, it's, hard, it's always hard for me to swallow in, in looking at those significant changes because more times they're not, they didn't work. But in all fairness, it's worked for Bryson. Statistically, the net, when I look at his stats, it's he's dominant off the tee. His approach game is 53rd. He's second in putting. He, he needs work approach game, you know, strokes gain approach, but he's kind of always been that way. So it's like Bryson makes these huge changes to his body and his speed, and it's like, God, it's tough to argue. Now, we'll have to wait and see if his body can hold up, right? Can his body sustain this kind of regiment? which I think is a valid question. A lot of people push back on that. It's a valid question. Your body can only take so much. You know, um, I am, I am in my seventies now. <laughs> and, and, um, I last summer pursued, uh, club head speed. I wanted to see if a guy wow. my age could get faster. Mm. And, uh, at the end of June last year, I got, I got to a hundred. My goal was 110 miles an hour of club head speed. And I did it. And I was very wow. proud of it. Problem was I screwed up big time because I was swinging harder and faster than what my, in this case, my right hamstring upper tendon could, could handle. 
and I tore it. And I was four months on the DL. So in other words, I was swinging faster than what my body could could handle. Obviously, I'm an old guy. So uh, I, I had quit working out to the degree that I was in the gym. And I was just spending more and more time swinging faster and faster on the on the driving range. And, and so there's always a risk regardless of your level that your, your, your swing speed creates injury because tendons and ligaments uh, are different from muscles and they're not necessarily built to handle this. I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. worried more so about Bryson in terms of the hands and wrists than, than anything else. I think the left wrist, Mm -hmm. the left wrist in particular, especially with with the larger grip um, and, and that much speed that's where I would perceive he him to be most vulnerable to injury. Yeah. It may not ever happen. I hope it doesn't. Right. right? But but yeah, you get, there there comes a point, and there comes also a point. How do you how do you maintain this lifestyle for another twenty years? Yeah. You know, you it can't takes spend ten hours a day, mm-hmm. six days a week, consumed with working out and swinging hard. It takes work to maintain that speed. You know, no when's, the last time, when's the last time you saw Bryson post a putting video <laughs> <laughs> or a approach wedge video? I texted, I texted coach Chris. I said, go put a wedge in his hand. I want to see that because he starts hitting those wedges close. Nobody's going to beat him. Nobody not hitting at those distances. I mean, my goodness, the way he puts, forget it. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, you know, I, I got to tip my cap to him, though, you know, is like he's if he can sustain this. Statistically, it's working. If he starts hitting his wedges closer, it's over. I mean, th- at the distances that he hits it and in, in the way that he putts. Let me ask you this on the modern swing. I made this post on my Instagram where, where most of my followers are. Um, I said, you know, Joaquin Neiman and Cameron Young, two guys that were right there, first and second, um, Interviewed Cameron Young. I've been following Cameron Young. He's a great amateur player up in New York. Won the New York State Open as an amateur, which was crazy. The only person ever do that. Just absolutely bombs it off the tee. And Neiman bombs it. People don't realize Neiman's long for his wiry frame. But I made the comment. I said, look, these two, to me, represent the modern swing. I'll throw a couple components at you. They, you know, they take it back where they, they kind of let that right hip, you know, turn up and back. They lose flexion in that right knee. They kind of go up with, you know, they get some flexion in that lead wrist early. And then they kind of, you know, go down, sit on it, and then they just rotate. You know, it's like flex, face is square, and they just rotate and get out of the way. And I said, look, that's, to me, when I look at social media, most teachers, that's what I see posted. I don't see Luke List, Scotty Scheffler types of swings where the face is more rotated open with a little extension in the lead wrist. Um bring that maybe down on a little steeper plane angle like Phil did, and then, you know, kind of swivel it, right? I don't see that as, hey, here, look at this. This is what you can learn from. I see Neiman, Cameron Young, elongate up, flex the wrist, sit it down, and rotate and open up like a madman. What do you, what do you think of just, I guess, the modern swing of what I said there? You agree with well, that? Is that the cause or the effect? <clears throat> of... The effect of the athlete being better, or I, I'm saying I, I've got a I've got a video that I keep on my phone of a of a three year old kid swinging a plastic golf club. He mm-hmm. happens to be left handed, and and uh, his golf swing is virtually identical to Bubba Watson's, jumping up off the ground. Yeah, you know, lead mm-hmm. lead foot coming up in the air. All this, that's a three year old, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know that he has an understanding of elongating his trail leg and <laughs> right and ground force reaction and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. He's just swinging his damn hands and arms. And the, and the, even the plastic club is a little heavy for him and his body accommodates itself to the swing speed that he had. Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that my question to you was, does the ground force reaction move in anticipation of the swing speed just swing on the hands and arms fast yeah. or does it create the the, the the swing speed i think it's a fair question yeah right. yeah no, i and, think it's a fair I, question yeah i think I, I just think that 
um, look, I, I got pictures of Nicholas. I, I was mm -hmm. fortunate enough to spend a, a whole bunch of time with Sam Snead uh, early in my teaching career and, and, and Toski. They were wonderful to me and, and whatnot. And, and I learned a lot from them in the sense that the body and the, and the swing have to somehow be coordinated. Mm -hmm. And, and in today's modern swing, we are, we are deviating from on center hits to max club head speed as our goal. Mm -hmm. Right. And so as a consequence of that, we're allowed a little bit more freedom in the, in the movement that we make and a little bit more violence in the movement that we make. Mm -hmm. And the natural extension um, of swinging harder is what you see in terms of the wrist and the, and the body rotation and, and the, the jumping off the ground. I, I don't, I don't think that they are trying to do that. I, I think that's a reaction in most cases to the athlete and to trying to, to make athletes speed. swinging faster. Yeah. It's interesting. Let me ask you that did, did Sneed Jack back in the day ever like tell you ever say to you, yeah, you want to let this, let the right knee straighten up. Don't keep it flex. Did they ever use the terms like, hey, go ahead, like feel like you're going to squat into the ground and then rotate? Like, were there, were there some, of, some of that happening way back then? You know, um, Jack Nicholas worked a lot with Jack Grout. Right. And they worked a lot on footwork. Okay. And, and Jack really worked, especially on his right leg, just rolling on the inside of his right ankle. And, and he, he lifted his left heel and got his left thigh and knee well behind the golf ball. I mean, I've got pictures uh, of him again on my phone. And, and his backswing position in the 60s is virtually identical to what Bryson's doing today. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think you make a great point because, you know, Jack was the longest, right? Yep. Bryson's the longest. What are they doing? Well, they're just elongating up. <laughs> and I think that, the, look, you can, if you have active feet, then you have to have a quiet head in your golf swing. Mm. If you have quiet feet, then you can have an active head. It can move around a little bit, but you can't have both. You can't have I'm the stealing head. that, by the way. What's that? I'm going to steal that, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> I your, like that. That's good. Feet. You know, that's why that's why Jack Grout used to grab Nicholas by the head, head of hair and, and hold it and, and make him turn and swing his hands as high as he could. But, mm. but he always had his head in, in, in position to, to be the center of the golf swing. Yeah. And, and as a consequence of that, Jack became who he is today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you got players like Curtis Strange, who went to see Jimmy Ballard, kept both feet on the ground, moved his head to the right a lot. You can do both of those, but you can't mm -hmm. do them both at the same time. That's that's good. That's interesting. Yeah, that uh, one's more powerful than the other, though. That's for sure. No question. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't. You know, it, it's harder for a pitcher to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball out of the stretch than it is from a full windup, mm -hmm. where he can use where he can use his entire range of motion and flexibility and and, and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, if you want to, if you want, I missed the memo in the 80s that said you have to keep your right knee flexed and your left heel down. Yeah. I, I missed that and I'm, yeah. and I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Well, you helped a lot of people through that process, I think for sure. Um, and, and, and letting that happen. Let's talk about one of your students, Paul Casey, who you've taught for a long time. Uh, Paul's 44, been together, you said 21 years, I believe yeah. now. Yeah, 21 years. We saw him at the Genesis, he was 15th. Um, when we get, when we going to see him next and, and how, how's, uh, Paul looking, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things I've done in my career, but I'm, but I'm maybe the proudest of the fact that, that we've been together for 21 years and for 21 years, he's been uh, an elite ball striker in professional golf, you know, first on the European tour and then obviously here in America and now worldwide. Um, you know, he, he's consistently ranked in the top 10. Yeah, uh, of ball striking categories, and and that doesn't the, get the credit either. He doesn't. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't get the credit. Uh, his his putting was probably the the best in in two thousand ten two thousand nine when he was ranked third in the world, 
and and his he he fought some injuries and some off course problems, a divorce and all that stuff. And I don't know that his putting has has ever come back to the level that it was, you know, mm-hmm. 10, 12 years ago. He's working his way back. Right now, it's the one thing that keeps him from the winner circle. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. I, I, don't, yeah. I didn't look at the stats for this week, but but he was uh, going into Sunday. Uh, he was he was first or tied first in strokes gained approach. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he he was first in in greens hit for the week, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, yeah. So- I mean, he's he, but he's always right there. He doesn't. To your, what I was saying, he doesn't get the. He he should be on that shorter list of when you start rattling off like JT Morikawa those kinds of players, like yeah. you start working your way down into that, you know, next little tier Casey should be right there. And he's long too. He's, you know, he's, he always impresses me. He's, he's 305, 307, you know, he's in that upper third, still 44 years of age, still busted out there off the, you know, yeah. I mean, if his putting gets going, there's no question. Paul Casey will be a factor in, in well, winning tournaments. Over the last oh, six or eight years, um, we've worked diligently to 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 get his footwork improved, get off his left heel more, mm. uh, get more lower body turn going back, so he can maintain his range of motion, and and so on, and and that's why he's maintained his speed. I mean, he he's up around 180 miles an hour, 182 miles an hour of ball speed uh, when we work here in Arizona wow. uh, range, and at 44, I think that's pretty damn good. So we, yeah. we we haven't changed his DNA, but we've we've elongated it in the sense of working out more and, and, yeah. and getting off the left heel more and getting, make sure he's turned and some things that we're doing in terms of, of making the pivot still uh, viable for a 44 year old. Yeah. See those changes make sense to me, right? Like I, you know, like turning the right hip, elongating, loading up more. We see JT lifting his left heel now, like those kinds of things I think can happen. I, I, when you start changing you know, positions with the club, that the pitch of the shaft, and then how that is going to affect transition. Those are the things that, wow, that's, to me, that's a little more of a wholesome change. You know, when you start going down that path, he was, uh, he was 5.6 positive in strokes gain approach. Paul was, you know, that's a big number. And so, and, and again, going back to teaching and, you know, I grew up for good or for bad. I, I happen to think it was good. You know, we didn't have video cameras when I was starting. We had a, we would we would take pictures, take the take the film to the drugstore, get it processed, and take three or four days. And when you got the pictures back, you said, "Well, I, I don't need to look at that now because I'm not swinging that way anymore." You, yeah. You on other stuff in the meantime. Then we had the graph check camera, and and I had to learn. I had to learn to train my eyes to see the golf swing in slow motion, even though it was in real time, and. We, we had to learn tricks and, and, and this is the beauty of, of being a combination old school and new school, you know, um, take a Ricky Fowler, it, 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 whatever his bad shot was, let's say it was a, it was a pull hook. Mm-hmm. Then I would put him behind a tree and, and make him start it out to the right mm-hmm. and hook it. Yeah. And and just stay there and be afraid of the ball bouncing off the tree and hitting you in the head. Mm-hmm. But use use ball flight changes to induce swing changes because that's the type of player he was. I don't see any of that being done today, or very very little. Yeah, yeah. There's less of it. Yeah, for sure. I'm probably right in the middle. You know, I like using my eyes. Um, you know, I like you know to see the numbers, understand the numbers. You know, 3D is fascinating. Looking under the hub, the hood, and seeing some of those things for it. I mean, it, it's all inter- It's all good stuff. I think it it has value. I, but I, I do like using my eyes. I like looking at the golf ball. Uh, I like having that conversation with the student um, around my lessons. You said 21 years. That's just that's that's an incredible run. But you look at the you look at the top guys, Peter. Like John Rahm's number one. Uh, his longtime coach, he still works with back in in Spain, but he's also a long time with uh, the TPI guys, you know, out in California, a, a long tenure. Colin Morikawa has been with Rick Sessenhouse his pretty much his full life. Um, Patrick Cantlay has been with Jamie Mulligan since he was 10 years old. Victor Hovland um, switched to Jeff Smith probably a couple of years ago, but primarily to help him with his, just the short game shots, which I think they've done a, a good job of that. But Vic's 
pretty independent, you know, like he doesn't really, he's not bouncing around. Let's put it that way. Right. <clears throat> Rory McIlroy, um, you know, Michael Bannon, you know, had a little, he, he couldn't get him over here. So he, you know, Cowan helped him a little, but for the most part, he's with Bannon long tenure, Scotty Scheffler with, um, Randy Smith long time. These guys have been together, Justin Thomas and his dad. <laughs> I'm just going right down. The, I'm going right down the list here, Peter. You know, these guys aren't bouncing around, you know, like these you know, are, I, these are guys that get their guy, stay the course. There's been a lot of ups and downs, huh? but believe in what you're doing. And let's, let's just, let's go. Yeah. Fascinating. Brown, you know, I coined the phrase, the, the, the three M's in teaching. Um, and I noticed them around the late eighties, early nineties in, in particular, but the three M's were method, marketing, and money. And I, I saw certain teachers who in, invented a method so that they could market it and then obviously earn some income. And so I think everybody in the late eighties, mid to late eighties, early nineties was pursuing this mythical, uh, model yeah and and so we saw people trying to standardize their golf swing uh, accordingly you know whether it was it was this guy's method or that guy's method whatever the case may be and then around the 2000 2004 i started noticing more individuality in the golf swings that were coming out and, and that's what you're seeing today is that mm -hmm. is that guys want a swing that's functional that they that they they own in the sense that Jim Furyk owned his swing, mm -hmm. uh, or or some other players of, of that ilk that they didn't try to pursue positions, they didn't try to pursue standardization. They just knew what they did, what worked for them, and they kept doing it over and over and over again. So under pressure, um, those were the guys that I thought always had a better chance of of coming out on top. And now you're seeing the same thing with this new breed of golfer coming along where they, they, they have their coach. They're fortunate enough to have somebody in Dallas or somebody in Ohio yeah. or somebody in Florida, whatever that they grew up with and they're sticking with it. Right. And I think that that's great because that, that increases the chances that they're not going to try and change their DNA. Yeah. It's interesting. I'll keep going. Number eight, Xander, you know, his dad. Um, now he's, he's done a couple things with his putting here and there, but Dustin Johnson, Alan Terrell, coastal Claude's been with him a long time. Hideki's 10. Yeah, I'm not sure there with Hideki Cameron Smith's 11, 11 grant fields been his longtime coach. I mean, just, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty wild when, when you think about it. So anyway, look, there's a lot of great teachers out there that, that people oh, ever heard yeah, of. Yeah. I, you know, grant I was field. fortunate. I was fortunate to up until this year, uh, I was on every top 50 or top 100 list and whatever, but I always thought that those were more popularity contests than, yeah. than actual grading of quality of instruction. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of really good teachers out there. And the only way you find out about them is if their 12 year old that they started working with 10 yeah. years ago makes it on tour at 22 and, and you hear about it. Right. Yeah, it's it's certainly heavy with the guys that teach the players, and they're and they're good teachers. You know, they they really are, and I enjoy the conversation. But there's so many that don't, so many that don't that are that are right there. You know, with them on just not only intellect, but just the the ability to communicate and you know get results. So, all right, we could go forever, Peter, but I know you got a you got a, a busy week. This was fun. I appreciate you you jumping on and and talking instruction. You know, I mean that's at the end of the day that's. Well, that's our DNA, right? You know, and and, and I'm happy. I, I, I know um, uh, I was somewhat disappointed with my departure from CBS, but I am ecstatic now to be back to my roots, you yeah. know, inventing teaching aids, working on helping people. And uh, that's my true love, my true passion. And, and I tried to do it with a microphone for 30 years, but um, I, I much more enjoy, you know, helping just the average player. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. And, um, you know, you did a great job with the microphone in your hand too. And like I said, I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more of that in, in the telecast because, well, according to your 
study at CBS that the sort of the sort of the fans, right? They they like to see some of that too, and some of that um what what these guys are doing and how they do it. Peter, go follow him. Peter Costas on Twitter. We'll do it again here uh down the road. Love to. Take care, Tara. All right.